Right, so let's get started. Um, so before we go on with the introduction to Gem5 talk, I just want to quickly introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. So I'm Andreas Sandberg. You may have seen me on the Gem5 mailing list. I use Gem5 quite a lot in my day job at ARM. Um, so, and many of the things I do are contributed back to Gem5, uh, the open source project. Um, my day job is mainly doing research on memory systems in ARM research. I'm joined by my colleague, Nikos Nikolaris. Um, you want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah. So I'm also working as part of the memory systems group uh, within ARM research. Um, a large part of my day, day life is uh, spent developing Gem5. I, I use Gem5 uh, for testing out new ideas uh, that we might have. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. Thank you, Nikos. Right, so let's get started. So why are we using Gem5? Well, one of the main selling points in Gem5 is that it's a full system simulator where you can run real workloads. And some of these workloads uh, include Android and Chrome OS. And we can, in fact, run things like Android Nougat and this work bringing up um, the latest version of Android, Android Oreo, I believe, uh, which will run on a 4.4 or 4.9 Linux kernel. And that's all pretty cool. And you have these uh, a fairly large component library with network components, disks, and stuff. And, this, and on top of that, you can wire up custom models, which we'll hear more about in the afternoon session. It's extremely useful for things like early prototyping, where you want to test a large number of things quickly. Um, and there's a fairly large use base in both industry and academia. But it's worth noting that it's not a microarchitectural simulator. So there will be some shortcomings in fidelity of things like the out-of-order model, which is modeled on old alpha. So it's not doing state-of-the-art things we do in modern chips. So if you're doing microarchitecture, you might want to consider either tuning the existing models or at least have a good understanding of what the drawbacks are. Um, that's the out-of-order model. The in-order model is slightly more reasonable. It was designed to look a lot like existing in-order cores. But then in-order cores are quite a lot simpler than out-of-order cores. Um, Gem5 has the notion of configurable level of detail. So if you look at the simulation landscape out there, you have things like virtualization, which is really quick, but doesn't give you any insights at all. And then you have cycle accurate RTL simulations, which are extremely detailed, but they're extremely slow. So you usually can't run any interesting workloads at all. Or if you do, it's going to be a sim point, and it's going to be very short, and just a few million instructions. Gem5 sort of lives in the space in between, um, and supports hard virtualization. And this allows you to trade off between detail and speed. The cool thing in Gem5 is you can do this at runtime. So if you're running a large application like Chromos, you can run in KVM mode and use hardware virtualization to reach a point of interest really, really quickly, and then switch to a more detailed mode at runtime. Um, plenty of cases where you don't want to use Gem5. If you're designing a chip, want to do performance validation, Gem5 isn't the tool for you at least not without a more accurate microarchitectural model in, in the back end, which it can wire up. And in fact, we do sometimes. We do that for GPU models, for example. If you want to do core microarchitecture, lots of, lots of caveats. Just make sure you know what you're looking for and what the trade-offs are. You could potentially use Gem5 to evaluate branch predictors, but you probably don't want to do it to use Gem5 to look at things like how big should my physical register file be. In that case, you want RTL simulation pretty much. You might not want to use Gem5 for things like functional correctness either, because we're usually not at the bleeding edge of the architecture definition. That's just the nature of a research tool. We can't invest the amount of time we need to add the latest and greatest. That's true to some extent, because some things are going to be bleeding edge. We use Gem5 internally for things like uh, instruction set prototyping. And you will see some contributions in that area fairly soon where we'll contribute um, vector extensions to Gem5 and ARM. And actually, some of the foundation work for that has been contributed already. If you want to get involved, there's lots of interesting information out there. Um, there's 
Jason Lopar's book on Learning Gen 5, excellent resource. There is the ASPLUS 2017 tutorial that I gave together with some colleagues from ARM. Um, the slides are online, you can find them on the Gem5 wiki. The mailing lists for you to discuss your work on Gem5 or your use cases. And of course you can contribute code. And there's an excellent contribution guide in the Git repository called contributing.md. It was again written up by Jason. Um, that tells you everything you need to know to get started. And keep in mind, Gem5 is a community effort. So we need your help to run the project. Right, and because we're a bit short on time, I'm going to skip straight to what I find the more interesting part of this talk, which is an overview of the CPU models we have and the memory system. And I'm going to hand over to Nikos to do that. Thank you, Andreas. Um, so with the background of um, what Andreas talked about before, I would like to spend, to spend some minutes talking about a high level overview of the most basic models we have within Gem5. And naturally, like, um, a CPU model is something that we, like most simulations, would use. Um, as Andreas mentioned, like we have uh, Gem5 is a configurable simulator that allows, um, um, allows us to, to, to trade uh, performance for accuracy. And a very good example of, of, of that is um, the, the CPU models we have in Gem5. So as Andreas mentioned before, um, we can use either the Linux uh, kernel virtualization machine, uh, which is based on hardware virtualization to um, ba basically uh, run in near native speeds uh, our system. Uh, the KVM CPU is very fast. Uh, but it allows pretty much no information about the performance we get. Uh, we cannot use any caches and we cannot hook any branch predictors, for example. Um, then we have uh, some ba basic uh, simple CPU, which assumes that every instruction will take one cycle, and that would be the atomic simple CPU. Uh, and then we have the timing simple CPU, which makes the, the same assumption, but also accounts for latency to the memory. Um, both simple CPUs are slightly faster, uh, are slightly slower than the KVM CPU, but they of course provide uh, some time information. Um, uh, they allow uh, elaborate memory systems, and we have some limited support for, um, for example, warming our, our branch predictor. Apart from execution-driven uh, uh, simulations, we can also do trace-driven uh, simulations with a trace CPU. Uh, that has uh, roughly the same time information as the atomic uh, simply use, uh, the atomic and the timing simple CPUs, uh, but it doesn't doesn't have any support for for branch predictors. Um, our more detailed CPU models are the derived O3 CPU, which is a basic out of order, uh, which which models like a basic out of order CPU, and the minor CPU, which uh, models in an order CPU. Uh, both of them are much slower than any other model in Gen5, uh, but they have, uh, they, they give a lot of fidelity into uh, the application's performance and the system's performance overall. Uh, we can use elaborate memory systems and branch predictors. So what's, what's, what's interesting here in this graph is that uh, we see that all of them inherit from the base CPU class, and we, which basically defines functions and, and interfaces uh, that allows us to, to switch between them at runtime. Uh, we have two talks, related talks, uh, a 215, trace driven simulation of multi thread application Gen 5, and a 245, generate synthetic traces uh, for the Linux architectures. And um, yeah, and for more, you, you'll get a lot more information, especially on the trace CPU. Uh, Gen 5 has also like um, um, two different uh, models for the memory system. Uh, we have the classic memory model. Uh, which is a fixed uh, Moesi snooping coherence protocol, and it uses a, a crossbar as its interconnect, uh, whereas like uh, the Ruby memory system uh, is much more elaborate and allows us flexible definition of coherency protocols um, and network to topologies. It provides a uh, domain-specific language to define them, um, Currently, Gem5 supports a plethora of, of coherency protocols, but it's quite easy to add, um, you know, 
if you want to experiment with your latest and greatest idea on coherence protocols. Uh, Ruby makes it easy to extend uh, uh, and not, and not uh, add this coherence protocol. We have a talk by Jason on 9, 945, learning Gem5 and modeling cache coherence with Gem5. And then at 11.15, uh, Tushar is going to talk about um, network uh, on chip, on chip networks. Um, on the off, on off chip, uh, we also have support for uh, less detailed and more detailed um, models. Uh, we have the simple memory, which basically is a main memory with a fixed latency uh, and some run variants that we can we can add to that and fixed bandwidth. Um, but if you want more detail, then of course you can use mm -hmm. uh, the DRAM controller, which is a class uh, that can model like all the latest and greatest uh, DDRs, uh, LPDDRs, YDIO, HBMs, and all sorts of protocols. Um, this is a top-down DRAM memory controller. Um, it doesn't model actually how, exactly how the DRAM works, but on a higher level, just some mechanisms, uh, the organization of the classic organization of DRAMs into banks, ranks, uh, columns, uh, with a lot of parameters to configure the timings uh, to access these. Um, I would encourage you to have a look at the, um, the C++ uh, header file and source code uh, to see how the DRAM works, and also like the Python code which defines and, and configures like uh, some, some popular configurations like DDR3, DDR4, LPDDR, uh, YDIO, and such. Uh, Radhika is going to talk about uh, low power mods in, in DRAM at 11.45. And yeah, so the simulation objects in the memory system, um, they def they connect, they're connected together through ports. Um, we have um, uh, master ports and slave ports. Uh, a master model will have at least one master port. A slave model will, ha will have at least one slave port. And an interconnect model will have at least one of its. And typically, or always, a master port will be connected to a slave port. This is very similar to how uh, TLM2 notation uh, defines uh, the models. Uh, for example, like in a very, very simple configuration where we have like CPU and a very simple memory system, the CPU is a master model because it has only master ports, uh, a port to the D cache and a port to the instruction cache. Uh, the caches in the TLM2 notation are defined as interconnects because they include both a slave and a master port, pretty much the same as the bus. And the memory, since it has only slave ports, um, it's a slave model. Uh, at 3.15, uh, we have a talk on how to interface Gen5 with System C, and which allows interfacing with a lot of interesting models we have in System C and Gen5. And with that, we get pretty much the basic, some very basic information about uh, 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 a simple system looks like in Gem5. So we have a cluster uh, with CPUs and some, some on-chip um, memories like uh, caches. Uh, we can define like another cluster like that. We have the off-chip memory system and a lot of I.O. devices that I don't have the time to go through. And with that, I would like to thank you. Um, that's it from the Gem5 introduction from us. Uh, I'm very excited about the talks and I'm looking forward to many, many of the, of the presentations today.